Flashman and the Tiger by George MacDonald Fraser, book review. So this is the 11th book in the Flashman series. I've been reviewing a lot of these Flashman books on this channel and talking about them. Uh, if you haven't seen the previous videos or if you're new to the Flashman series, I, I'm not going to talk all about the premise behind these books because this, this is the 11th book here. Uh, I'll leave a link to my previous videos down below. Uh, the short version is there a type of satirical historical fiction uh, about the British Empire. For, for, for any more description about it, you can check uh, the videos in the link in the description down below. But this book is book number 11 in the Flashman series. And this one is a bit unique. Uh, it's the only book in the Flashman series that is actually not one complete story, but it's three small stories in one binding. Uh, and the stories are uh, The Road to Charing Cross, The Subtleties of Baccarat, and Flashman and the Tiger. Uh, and they're, they're all three separate stories. They're not connected any more than they're all in the usual Flashman continuity. Now, of these, the, the longest of the stories by far, the one that takes up the bulk of the book, is actually the first one, The Road to Charing Cross, which in my copy clocked in at 219 pages, uh, including the footnotes. Uh, the second two shorter stories are 60 pages each. Uh, and in fact, Flashman and the Tiger is actually the shortest of the three stories. It's the one that takes up the least space in the volume, and yet it's the story that the whole volume is named after. Presumably because Flashman and the, and the Tiger was kind of a catchy title, I guess. Now, uh, despite the shorter length of these stories, the book is not a disappointment. Uh, even though each story has fewer pages than your normal Flashman story, it never feels like they're too short or that they're truncated or that they're hurried in any way. Uh, each story feels like it's exactly the natural length that it needs to be. Uh, and it loses none of Flashman's narrating style or usual philosophical reflections or Flashman's various digressions. They're all in here, even though the, the story length is shorter. My only complaint is about the footnotes. So the thing with the Flashman books is the footnotes are half the fun. Uh, if you're familiar with the series, you go to the back of the books and the footnotes expand on what Flashman... Uh, the, the book notes give a lot more historical background to the Flashman story. In the, the normal Flashman book, you would just flip all the way to the back and find the footnotes. And it's a little bit awkward because you have to, you know keep your place in the main book while also finding where the footnote is in the back. But it's obviously doable. And uh, what, what helps it is that the back of the book is very easy to find. It's just in the back. Here, at least in my edition, the publishers have put the footnotes at the end of each story. So there's the road to Charing Cross, then the footnotes for that story, then the next story, then the footnotes for that story. So it's a little bit more awkward to find the footnotes. You don't just flip to the back. You've got to be like, okay, where are the footnotes here? They're somewhere in the middle of the book. I, I wish the publishers would have just put all the footnotes in the back. I, I don't know if this is different for different editions. I mean, let me know if you, you read an edition of this book in which all the footnotes were in the back. But that minor complaint aside, the, the book works perfectly well. So let's talk about this then. Uh, the first story, uh, The Road to Charing Cross. Uh, this is the longest of the three stories. It's probably more properly a novella than a short story. Uh, like many of the Flashman stories, it has two acts. Uh, the first act covers the Congress of Berlin, Bismarck, uh, and the eccentric 19th century journalist, Stephen Blowitz. Uh, now, prior to reading this book, I had no idea about the Congress of Berlin, why it happened, what it was, what it accomplished, who was there. I, I also didn't know anything about the famous 19th century journalist Stephen Blowitz. Uh, 
but I had a lot of fun learning about it in this book. And as always, uh, it's a great way to learn history and the actual real historical details are mixed in with Flashman's crazy antics. It's, it was a lot of fun to read. But, but that's just the first part of the story. The second act covers the opening of the Oriental Express, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Emperor Franz Joseph, and his tense relationship with, Empire, with Empress Elizabeth and the Hungarian independence movement. Once again, if you're at all mildly curious about any of the, these things, or you, you think they could be interesting, then Flashman is a great way to learn some history while having some fun doing it. Uh, just a, a con continuity note. Uh, the story follows the characters and situations introduced in Royal Flash, which is the second book in the Flashman series. I, I have to confess I read these books slightly out of order, just because uh, I had trouble tracking them down in order when I was living abroad. Uh, and if you're like me and if you're reading them out of order, make, make sure you read at least Royal Flash before reading this one. Well, and, and of course, start with the first one. Start with the first book and then Royal Flash and, and then this one. Okay, I'm going to talk briefly about some connections that this book had or this story had to other books I've reviewed on this channel. So I, I reviewed on this channel The Revolutions of 1848 by Priscilla Robertson. And in that book, it talked about uh, the major hero of the failed Hungarian independence movement in 1848, whose name was, I think I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but Kusoth, Kusuth, uh, K-O-S-S-U-T-H. Now, from Priscilla Robertson's book, as far as I can remember it, I got a very positive impression of Kusuth. Um, in this Flashman book, though, it's a bit less of a positive impression. Now, granted, he doesn't actually appear himself in the book. But he's referenced a couple of times as more of a like a regular firebrand type character. Uh, and he has some connections with the villains of the this book who are unsavory characters. So it's, it's a little bit of guilt by association, although it's a tentative connection, a tenuative connection. Uh, also, uh, I read uh, and reviewed a biography of uh, Sir Francis Richard Burton on this channel some time ago. And this uh, Flashman story continues the tradition of Flashman making throwaway references to Richard Burton. Uh, it's unfortunate that, the, unfortunate that there was never a book with the two of them together on an, on an, on an adventure. I would have really loved to read that. Uh, but it's just throwaway references. And then the other Flashman book I would have really loved to read, but which never got written, uh, was Flashman with General Gordon at Khartoum. Uh, and this, this is, was a major theme in a couple books I read, Three Empires on the Nile by Dominic Green or The Scramble for Africa by Thomas Pakenham, both of which I reviewed on this channel. Uh, we're, we're never going to get that book now because George MacDonald Frazier passed away in 2008 but this book is the closest we get to it. Uh, one of the subplots of this story is that Flashman is, being, is doing everything he can to avoid being sent to Sudan with General Gordon. Uh, and the final pages of the book show Flashman, Flashman failing in his attempts and being sent out with General Gordon on the expedition anyway. It's very unfortunate that uh, George MacDonald Frazier never lived to write that book, although Maybe he never wanted to. Maybe the whole point of this is he, he was just deliberately teasing the readers uh, with this story uh, and the, the fact that we get glimpses of Flashman with Gordon but never actually get to see the story. Maybe, maybe that's just the whole joke. Okay, moving on now to the second story within this volume, The Subtleties of Baccarat. So uh, this story involves, again, something I had never heard of, but you could look this up on Wikipedia. Uh, the Baccarat Scandal. It's a card cheating scandal uh, where somebody cheated at a card game and it became famous uh, in, in the Victorian era because it involved the Prince of Wales himself, uh, Queen Victoria's son and the future King Edward VII. It seems ridiculous, but this was actually a thing. 
uh, where one member of the people they were playing cards with was accused of cheating and it, it blew up into this huge, big social scandal. So you, you can look at this up on Wikipedia or better yet, you can read about it in this book. Uh, Flashman is involved in in this retelling of the story and it's a once again, it's a perfectly fun way, delightful way to learn about a otherwise forgotten or quirky little piece of history. The final one is Flashman and the Tiger. And this one is unique because not only does it uh, do the usual thing of integrating Flashman into history, but it also integrates Flashman into a Sherlock Holmes story, uh, The Adventures of the Empty House, uh, where... Sherlock Holmes is point, pitted against Colonel Moran. Colonel Moran is uh, depicted in the Sherlock Holmes story as being one of the subordinates of Moriarty, uh, although this, this story takes place after Moriarty had already died, if, if I remember my Sherlock Holmes correctly. Uh, but because of that association with Moriarty, Colonel Moran has gone on to play Moriarty's henchman to, in, uh, sorry, not play, to be depicted as Colonel Moriarty's Sorry. Colonel Moran has gone on to be depicted as Moriarty's henchman in a number of the cinematic representations of Sherlock Holmes, like those Robert Downey Jr. Jude Law movies that came out a few years ago uh, had Colonel Moran as one of the antagonists. So anyways, there's uh, Colonel Moran is facing off against Sherlock Holmes in The Adventures of the Empty House, and while this is happening, it turns out that Flashman has also had his own little crisis against uh, Colonel Moran. It, it's a bit like, what's what's the name of that play? Uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstein are dead. Uh, it's this famous play uh, where Tom Stoppard is imagining the adventures of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and is having these adventures take place concurrently to what's going on in the main plot of Hamlet. Uh, this is this is similar to that. It's it's uh, Flashman is having his own uh, crisis with Colonel Moran and is taking place concurrently with what's going on in the Adventures of the Empty House, the uh, Sherlock Holmes story. I actually read the Sherlock Holmes story way back when I was working my way through the complete Sherlock Holmes book. I had forgotten it, uh, you know, as you do when 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 you read a large collection. A couple years later, you tend to forget most of the stories, or at least I do. So I went back and reread it when I was uh, reading uh, Flashman and the Tiger, and it does line up very well, and it's worth rereading if you're going to read this book. It also integrates uh, into the real history, of course. There's uh, Flashman at Rourke's Drift, which is a famous British military disaster in South Africa. It's part of the backstory to this. It's why Colonel Moran has developed his antipathy towards Flashman. Uh, and this story also, as well, drops hints about Flashman's adventures with Gordon at Khartoum. Uh, the late Christopher Hitchens, before he passed away, actually wrote about this story. Uh, it was published in a collection, uh, one of his collections, a book called Arguably, but I, I believe it was originally published separately as an essay. Uh, I've found it at the on the internet at one time, but that, that link seems to have been taken down. Uh, you, you might be able to find it on the internet somewhere, or either that, you just have to buy the book, Christopher Hitchens, arguably. Uh, but it's, it's an essay in which Christopher Hitchens, who is a Flashman fan, uh, Christopher Hitchens reacts negatively to this story because he says it shows that Flashman is going soft. So Christopher Hitchens says the delightful thing about the early Flashman stories is that he was such a repulsive character. He cared only for himself and just had blatant self-interest. In this story, Flashman and the Tiger, we see Flashman put his own life at, in danger to protect his granddaughter. And Christopher Hitchens says, okay, well, even though it's his own granddaughter, the Flashman I know would never have put his own self-interest in danger for anybody else. I've been thinking about this, and I actually think myself it works, uh, because I think people do, people do have a soft spot for their own children and grandchildren, even horrible people uh, who otherwise would 
in all other circumstances would show blatant self-interest uh, would uh, would want to protect their children and grandchildren. Um, I may be a little bit influenced. I, I just finished reading this book on Darwinian psychology or evolutionary psychology. But, you know, our children and our grandchildren have our genes. So people have, or at least our genes, have a naked self-interest in saving our children and grandchildren. Um, but I do admit that like all debates about literary characters, uh, what would this character really do? Is, is this story true to the true nature of this character? It, it's all a bit subjective and it all comes down to your interpretation of the character. Of course, that's part of the fun as well. So, uh, you know, chime in. Uh, go ahead, read Christopher Hitchens' essay. Uh, let me know, wh what do you think? Is Christopher Hitchens right and that this story shows that Flashman is getting fat, is getting soft? Uh, or is, is this legitimate? Is this perfectly in keeping with Flashman's character? It, it's, it's all part of the fun to think about this stuff and, and debate it. Okay, I'm going to sign off here.